we are starting a new sermon series called Honor Code. Um, and so last month, if you remember, or if you were here, we looked at the story of Moses, and we talked about the idea of courage. We talked about the idea of courage with character and conviction. And if we have these attributes, we can be a people, a community on a mission to share the gospel with the world, the good news. Today, we're going to talk about um, the code of honor, the honor code that we as Christians should have. You know, honor is something that is quickly fleeing our society. One of my favorite times to read about and learn about was World War II history. These men um, that sacrificed so much, hundreds of thousands of men, they sacrificed their lives to fight against a terrible evil. And it wasn't for their own personal gain. They didn't make a lot of money, but they laid down their lives for sheer honor. In fact, if you go look at some World War II history, you'll see that there were even men, they were so devastated, they, they couldn't serve their country, they actually took their own lives. I mean, can you imagine wanting to fight for your country or fight for your value system or loving the people around you so much that you didn't know what you were going to do if you couldn't fight for your country, if you weren't allowed or you weren't able to for whatever reason? Honor is something that I think, when I look at our culture, it's, it's hard to find. And I think the reason is, is a lot of people don't understand honor as a virtue. Honor is a tremendous virtue that we have. You know, Aristotle, when he talked about courage, here's what he had to say. He said, you will never do anything in this world without courage. It is the greatest quality of the mind next to honor. When our founding fathers, when they founded this great nation, they talked about honor and dignity and sacrifice. And Thomas Jefferson, he wrote this um, when he signed the Declaration of Independence. He said, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pled to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And a lot of them lost their lives. A lot of them lost their fortune. In fact, there was one spe specific individual, um, the enemy had invaded his home, and he called for fire upon his own home that he built. And he didn't have a quick, easy construction company that just had a pop-up that he could go live in. This was everything he lived for and sacrificed for, and yet honor was more important to him than his own money. And you know what? They sacrificed so much, but there was one thing they never sacrificed. You know what that was? It was their honor. Honor is one of the most important virtues that we can have. And I think that we would all be willing to admit that we live in a culture that has evolved into such a highly egocentric mentality that everything has become about us, about me, about my survival. And this doesn't really surprise me. I mean, for the last 40 to 50 years, our institutions that teach our young people, our college-educated people, have developed this worldview called scientific naturalism where the basic idea is biological, naturalistic evolution, and so it's the survival of the fittest mentality, that you got to take care of you. You have to survive. What's in it for you? What's in it for me? How will I live? What's best for me? And with this mentality, it reflects everything that we do to the point with our families, our societies. We will cast a vote in 2020 based on our understanding and what benefits us the most. The majority of us will. Well, what's going to help me out the most? It has become all about us. And why is that? Well, I think it's because we as a culture have lost in many ways our idea of honor. Now, if I were to define honor, I think many of us have another understanding of this idea. We would think that honor is simply respect. And it really is a society um, idea. It's this mentality that we've construct, constructed in society that we attribute admiration and value to something that is honorable. A straightforward definition of honor is simply this. You honor one another by doing this. You treat one another with genuine respect. If you were to look in the New Testament, the word honor comes from the Greek word tamao, and it means to have money paid or valuables or something like a price. You know, whenever I perform weddings, um, eventually after we talk about uh, the wedding a little bit, the, uh, the groom will always ask, well, how much is it going to cost? You know what my response is? How much is she worth? <laughs> Put him in, I trapped you. You know what I mean? But, um, but that's the idea that they had with honor was this price. This value, how much something is worth. For instance, in Acts chapter 4, verse 34, the early church was so incredibly impacted by the grace of God that they couldn't help but sell their things to meet the needs and the wants of the people around them. In fact, the Bible says they didn't have any wants, they didn't have any needs, and when they would sell their possessions, they would bring it to the feet of the apostles. But the word for money is honor. It's value. 
And so context, whenever you study the Bible, context ultimately determines the meaning of a word. But this idea of honor has this deep-rooted understanding of a price to be paid. And so honor, in a literal sense in the Bible, means wealth. But in an abstract sense, it means esteem, respect, dignity. You know, in ancient times, the men around the Mediterranean world, they would fight for honor. They would sacrifice for honor and for glory for themselves and for their nation. They would fight each other uh, in a way to earn honor. In fact, this is where we get the idea of the Olympics. The Olympics is coming up this year. Uh, really excited about it. And so, um, you know, this idea of fighting for a crown, this idea of gaining honor, you're the best. That's where we get this idea from. Honor was so important to the ancients. Julius Caesar said this, I love the name of honor more than I fear death. They would rather die with honor than to live without honor. That's how much it meant to them. When you look at the biblical times and you study this idea of honor, honor was a primary way that um, determined what kind of social status that you had. And there were two ways that you could get honor. You would either inherit it like a king or you would acquire it through some type of heroic feat that you would accomplish in the Old Testament. You know, it's really interesting. Honor meant so much to them in the biblical times that they would actually trace their genealogies to connect them with certain people um, throughout history. For instance, if you were to look at Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, where they talk about the lineage of Jesus, Matthew is primarily concerned with convincing his audience that Jesus is a Jew. And so he traces Jesus' genealogy through Joseph that goes all the way back to Abraham. But Luke is primarily concerned with convincing his audience that Jesus is king. And so a lot of people are like, well, the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. Jesus, uh, uh, Luke traces Jesus' genealogy through Mary. Why? He wants to trace Jesus' gene genealogy through the Davidic line back to King David. And so honor was everything. And speaking of King David, how in the world did David get his honor? If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Um, David, uh, if you don't know this, became the second king of Israel. And it had been um, 40 years that Moses led the Israelites into the desert. And they spent 40 years there. And unfortunately, Moses, as we said, he was a man of character. But at certain times, uh, he lacked, or he's a man of courage. At certain times, he lacked character. And so he directly disobeyed God out of anger. Um, God said, I will provide for you, and Moses in his anger struck the rock, and water came out of it. Long story short, Moses died and didn't enter the promised land, but the nation of Israel did. And so the nation of Israel um, produced this great kingdom, but they had a certain way in which their government operated, and they were crying out for a king. They said, look, we don't want God to be the king over us. We want to be like all these other nations that we see. God, we want a king. We want a king. And so God appoints this great, big, tall, good-looking guy, <clears throat> kind of like maybe similar to me. And, uh, and I'm just kidding. I'm short. I'm like 5'8", okay? It's the best I got. Uh, I'm like wide as I am tall. But it doesn't matter. Anyway, so this guy's tall, dark, and handsome, okay? All right. I'm not. He is. Regardless, I know you guys are just shaking your head, Rick. He did it again. Regardless, he becomes the king. And he's a great king. He leads Israel into victory. But God foresees Saul. His heart is going to change. And so God is going to choose somebody else. Now, a lot of people think of David as this little rug rat out in the countryside um, who's 140 pounds soaking wet. But David is actually a very strong, a very tall, and a very valiant type of guy. Um, as a shepherd, it was not an easy man's job. I mean, you had to fight off not just wolves, but David is actually going to tell how he has actually fought and killed lions and bears. I mean, the guy's legit, okay? I don't know if you've ever fought a bear before. I have not. Nine I had a dream I fought a bear two nights ago. It was the weirdest thing. It might have been from studying the sermon all week this week. But regardless, this David is actually pretty tough. And he is a shepherd out in the countryside. Um, and he's the youngest of his brothers. And so God has chosen David to become the next king of Israel. But Israel's got a big problem, literally. And his name is Goliath. And so Saul's heart has changed. God has chosen a new king, being David, over, the, over the, uh, the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel is at war with the Philistines. You ever watch, like, movies in the ancient Mediterranean times, and these people fight for honor, um, and they're willing to sacrifice everything, and they sail on ships, and they're like the Greeks and the Romans. I mean, these, these people that are just loving war, well, that's... That's the Philistines. These guys are war type of people. And they had one specific special guy, and his name was Goliath. And most of us know this story. 
Well, Goliath, for many, many days, would come out to the nation of Israel, and he wanted a one-on-one battle. The winner would become, obviously, the victor, and he would be the one who would receive the blessing from the king, and he would be extremely wealthy. And instead of everybody else dying in battle, let's just have a one-on-one battle, your best against our best. You think anybody wanted to take him up on that? No. (laughs) They were all very scared. And so they continued to fight with each other, but then you've got this guy named David who comes on the scene. And David is a little bit different than the rest of the Israelites. He's not trained in war, although he's fought lions and bears. He's not trained with a sword. He's just a tough guy with God on his side. And so David comes into the camp, and he says, who's this Goliath guy that's dishonoring our God? Who's this guy that's dishonoring our nation, our fellow Israelites? Well, this is, this is Goliath, and we're all too afraid to meet him in battle. Look what it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. It said, David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Who is this guy that's dishonoring our fellow people? Have you ever felt like you needed to stand up for somebody before? Have you ever come into contact with a bully? Man, when I was growing up, I didn't like bullies. And I came up from a little small town that was kind of rough on the outside of Columbus, Ohio. And, uh, and I didn't really care for bullies. And so, not to brag or be excited about it, it's really shameful. I wish I was a Christian, but I would often challenge bullies. And, you know, being in a tough town, um, we would often fight, you know, fist fighting stuff. Of course, now, you know, you can't do things like that um, because people will call the police. But, you know, sometimes we used to settle things. I don't want to say the old-fashioned way because I'm not that old, but that's just how we dealt with stuff. And that's how David is going to deal with it. He doesn't like bullies. And here's Goliath, who's a bully. And it goes on to say this in verse 27. It said, the people, defend, uh, the people answered him in according with his words, saying, thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Uh, And it goes on, and look what his oldest brother says. David, what do you think you're doing? Why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. So David is going to defend his own honor and integrity. His oldest brother says, look, dude, you're supposed to be guarding sheep. I know the real reason why you're here. You just want to watch fighting. You just want to watch people go at it. And look at what he responds with. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? And then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people answered the same thing as before. And so David says, this guy thinks he's tough. This guy, Goliath, he's lacking something very important. God is not on his side. And he's going to dishonor my fellow Israelites. He's going to dishonor my God. I will stand up. Here are all of these men who are trained in warfare who were not willing to fight Goliath. Why? Because they are afraid that they will die. And here is David, untrained from the countryside with God on his side, and he's willing to defend the honor of his God and his people. And so he goes to Saul. Saul says, who's this person? King Saul, who's this person, David, that wants to fight on our behalf? And so David has to defend himself. He says, look, in verse 34, your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and may the Lord be with you. David says, look, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of this guy. Honor is more important than life. That's what it meant to these people. And so David tries on Saul's armor. Now, here's what's cool. A lot of people, like I said, think David was this little rug rat, but he wasn't at all. David was actually a a very strong individual. And so he tries on Saul's armor. He's big enough. Saul was a very tall man. David's a tall, good-looking guy too. So he tries on Saul's armor. It actually says that in the text, by the way. David was handsome. I don't know why they put things in there like that. Uh, But anyways, it's kind of funny. If you ever write about me, now you know what to include, okay? So So here is David defending his own integrity, not only before his fellow Israelites, but before Saul, King Saul himself. He says, look, I can get the job done. I'm willing to fight on behalf of our people and on behalf of my God. And so David goes out to meet Goliath. But guess what? He didn't like the armor. Never wore it before. He had never worn army before. And so he tells Saul, Saul, look, this just doesn't fit. I don't like it. He takes it off. He goes out to meet Goliath. And on the way, he picks up five smooth stones. And he puts them in his sling. And he comes before Goliath. And Goliath is 
totally insulted. You know why? To present yourself in battle without armor was a chief insult to the other person. It meant you're not even worthy fighting, but I'm going to fight you anyways. And look at, look at Goliath's response. He says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? You got a shepherd's staff and a sling with stones? What do you think I am? I'm the greatest warrior in the known Mediterranean world, and here you're coming to me without even basic honor, without even basic dignity. You don't even have enough respect for me that you're not even willing to wear battle armor. You're nothing more than a loser. And look at what he says. And the Philistine cursed David and his gods. And the Philistine also said to David, Come to me, I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. You've dishonored my God and my fellow people, and I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down. I will remove your head from you. I mean, this isn't, this isn't, they're not being nice to each other. You're a dog with sticks. I'm going to cut your head off. <laughs> I mean, this is a pretty intense moment. We're laughing because we're reading about it. And he says, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth. I'm not even going to give you a proper burial. You have dishonored my people and my God so much, I'm going to let you be eaten by the animals. And he says that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all the assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And so he takes his smooth stones. Here's Goliath. Goliath goes out to meet him. And David's standing back. Now remember, David's a pretty strong individual. He's fought bears and lions. And he puts that stone in that sling, and he winds it up and whew, sends it off. And it hits Goliath in the middle of his head. The rock has such velocity to it that it actually indents his brain and kills him. And he slays him just like that. Defending the honor of his people and the honor of his God. And that's how they defended honor in the biblical times, in ancient times. And so David is highly esteemed. He gets the honor. He earns the honor and the respect of the people. And Saul brings him in and he blesses him. And the Bible says uh, Saul prospered David. Saul appointed David over his mighty men, over his warriors in the army. And David had so much honor because he earned it. He gained it with courage. And it also says this in 1 Samuel 18. David was praised by the people. It says, as it happened, they were coming. And when David returned from killing the Philistine, that women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines and with joy and musical instruments. And the woman sang this, and they played, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And so this was their way of saying, David is greater than Saul, and Saul couldn't stand it. Have you ever gotten jealous of someone that has succeeded more than you? Have you ever looked on Instagram or Facebook and you see the highlight reel of other people's lives and you grow jealous and envious and you begin to mourn what they have and what you don't have? That's the danger of envy. That's the deceit of jealousy. A culture that lacks honor will grow envious and jealous of the lives of the people and the success around them. It can't stand it. We need honor. And unfortunately, Saul grew so jealous of David that he actually tried to kill him. You know people will ruin relationships because of jealousy and envy? People will ruin relationships because of the success of the people around them. They are so concerned with their value, their honor, their worth, that they're willing to cut people off because of their own insecurities. That's exactly what Saul did. Now, honor was important to them today. And we don't solve the problem of honor like they did in the ancient times. We have a different understanding and a different way that we go about honor today. But I want to ask you this question. Why should honor be important to us today? Why should honor be important to you? What do you think about when you hear the word honor and respect? Now, I have to admit, I'm a competitive person. 
all right? I like to compete, I like to play games, and I like to win at whatever I do. That's just me to the core. And, uh, and as a young guy, I was the same way. I mean, I would actually mourn when other people would succeed. Um, I would mourn when other people would outperform me. I took the Enneagram test. For those of you who uh, like Enneagrams and uh, you want to be a loser like me, uh, go out and take the Enneagram test. I'm just kidding. The Enneagram test is really cool. It's a personality test. It's new and it's hot and it's cool. People do like Enneagrams and coffee or whatever. I'm a type three, which is the achiever. Is there any other type threes out there? Here's the type three in a nutshell. I want to get to the top and look good doing it. (laughs) That's basically what it is, okay? Now, that sounds really proud and arrogant, and I don't necessarily like to do that, all right? I don't want to look good doing it, but I want to succeed. I want to achieve. I want things to be great. That's how I am wired. And so that's how I've always been wired. I've always wanted to be the best. And when I lose, okay, when I don't win and I lose, I take it especially hard. That's just me. I'm an Ohio State Buckeyes fan. I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. So it's good on the Buckeyes side, bad on the Dallas Cowboys side so far. I can't stand it when my team loses. It just drives me nuts. But as you continue to mature and you become a Christian, you know that winning isn't the most important thing. In fact, I actually like to see other people win more than myself. You know what's better than winning? Other people winning. You know what's better than achieving? Other people achieving. I can't wait to see my kids succeed. I can't wait to see my wife succeed. I can't wait to see you succeed in your Christian life, in your business, in your relationships. I love that. In fact, I feel a sense of achievement when you achieve and you win. What does it mean to honor the people around you? Is it being sad that you've lost or is it being happy that they've won? Here's what the Bible says. This is why honor is important to us today. It says in Romans 12, 10, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Compete, outdo, outperform. Now as a Christian, it's no longer about fighting for honor for ourselves, but it's saying, how can I outdo in showing other people honor? How can I outdo the other people in this room and give them honor and recognize them and celebrate them and rejoice with them and make them better than what I am today? Here's why honor is so important. is because it is a central virtue to the Christian life. A life without honor is a life that is lacking Christ himself. Outdo one another with honor. As a result of loving each other, the Bible says, we will not seek our own value and worth, but we will seek the value and the worth of the people around us. You know, the Roman church had a problem. This is why Paul wrote Romans chapter 12, verse 10. The Jews said this, we're better than you non-Jews, you, you Gentile Christians, because God has given the Jews his word. And Jesus the Christ came from the Jews. Therefore, we have a higher value, a higher honor, a higher worth. And the Gentiles, they crossed their arms and said, well, you Jews aren't nearly as good as what you think you are. After all, the Jews are the ones who killed Jesus. The Jews are the ones who disobeyed God. I mean, if you look at the last thousand years of Israelite history, you've got a group of people who have disobeyed God. And so actually, we're better than you are. We have a higher worth than you. Yeah, God has given you his word, but we haven't done nearly as bad of things as what you've done. So they have this inner competition, this strive for self-worth and dignity and honor. And Paul says, look, you guys are both wrong because we're all sinners. We've all made mistakes. We've all dropped the ball. There is no reason for anyone to boast. Honor one another. Love one another. Outdo honor with each other. If I were to focus on a key phrase, I'd put it like this. If you're going to honor somebody, we should be cheering on the greatness of others rather than competing to be greater than others. That's what true honor is. How can I give this person value? How can I give this person worth? How can I give this person dignity? How can I outdo them by celebrating and cheering them on to be better than what they are? Not competing with me, but competing with themselves. When I played high school football, there was a guy named Buster Howe. Everybody knew Buster Howe's name. Like I said, I come from Zanesville, Ohio. And here's a picture of Buster Howe. Buster Howe played at my high school. He was the first Mr. Football in Ohio. And I think all of America. I mean, you go on YouTube and you look up this guy's highlight reel. It is ridiculous. In fact, if you were to talk to any of his teammates today, they all will self-admit, we were terrible. Buster was awesome. He made the blocks for us. I mean, this guy would out-juke the entire team 
through one play. It was insane. He played both sides of the field, both offense and defense. He returned uh, kickoffs and punts, and he was also the kicker and the punter. He did everything. The man never left the field. Literally Mr. Football. The guy was incredible. He had over 4,000 yards of rushing in his high school career, and he didn't start really running the football until the later part of his sophomore year. I mean, the guy was insane. He had 54 touchdowns. His number was only one of two numbers to be retired at my high school. And when I played football, I was one of the captains of the football team. And so we actually would get to sit down um, every Thursday. We'd get to sit down with one of the former, like, big-time names in high school football. And one of the times was Buster Howe. And he was a really cool guy. There were me and three other guys, our head coach, and Buster Howe. And so we're sitting there, and everybody's asking him questions, and we're hanging out, talking about Zanesville football. And I said, Buster, what is the greatest moment you ever had playing football at Zanesville? And I was shocked by his response. He said, when we went up on Newark, who was our rival, and I got to cheer on my teammates from the sidelines, I was blown away. I was shocked. You would figure it would be running the game-winning touchdown or intercepting the ball and returning it for a game-winning touchdown or having the most yards ever rushed uh, at Zanesville um, football or being elected and chosen as Mr. Football, but it wasn't. It was cheering his teammates on from the sidelines. It was honoring others, and that stuck with me and has never left me since high school. I've always remembered that. It taught me so much that day about what it meant to be a person of honor. It is not about me. It's about the people around me. Why is honor so important? Because who we honor reflects our character, and character is essential to everything that we do. Who are the people that you honor today? You look at our culture Who's most honored? Celebrities, music artists, people that play in movies, politicians. And you look at the majority of these people, and what do they do that is so honorable? What do they do that is so great? How is it that we have a culture have elevated things like sex, money, power, influence, and we have neglected the greater things of sacrifice, loyalty, character, virtue, and honor? You know what I appreciate most about the United States military is this deep sense of honor that they have. There's a code that they go by. It's called their honor code. I will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate anyone among us who does so. There's an honor oath. It goes like this. We will not lie, steal, or cheat, nor tolerate among us anyone who does. Furthermore, I resolve to do my duty and to live honorably. So help me God. Honor is the most important thing to the people who serve our great nation, doing what is right, doing what is worth value and dignity, obeying their commanders, falling in line, sacrificing for our great nation. I mean, in our culture, in my opinion, I really don't see anybody that deserves more honor than our military veterans. Do you? That is true honor. Not people who write songs about abusing women and men. Not people who support whether it's trafficking or um, drug abuse or drunkenness, those things aren't honorable to me. Honor is so important to the Christian life. To honor one another is literally this, to hold back our instinct to honor ourselves and instead honor those around us. You ever, you ever talk with somebody who's a one-upper? They always try to one-up everything that you have to say. Yeah, well, that's cool, but this is what happened to me. Or, yeah, that's great, but this is what I did. Fight back against that instinct to one-up the people around you. The Christian life literally means this, by outdoing one another in love. Here's what Paul is literally saying. Take the initiative to show honor. Be like David with Goliath. Everybody is holding back from fighting for what's right. And David takes the initiative. He goes out to the battlefield. We have a different battlefield in our culture. It's not like what David dealt with, but it's something worth fighting for. And so we should hold back this instinct to honor ourselves. We should take the initiative to show honor to the people around us without waiting for them to show it to you. You ever tried to honor somebody that has dishonored you? The Bible says we should outdo one another in love. It's not by withholding respect. It's not by withholding dignity. Are we going to earn honor or create a culture of honor? It's by showing it. You know, who are we to honor? And I I think the Bible is very clear. What does Romans 12 say? Honor only people like you? Or only people who give money? Or only people who have honor themselves? No, it says... Outdo one another 
and showing honor to each other. Honor everybody in this room, in the church. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've come from. We are to show honor. Now, how are we to show honor to others? It says, above yourself. Go before, show the way, set the example. When it comes to honoring others, the Bible says, take the lead. When it comes to respecting others, we're to outdo each other. When it comes to honoring others, we are to prefer and put others first. That's what Christ is calling us to. If we have courage without honor, we're missing it. Our goal is not to see who can obtain the most honor, but how we can confer the most honor on the people around us. That's why Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 3, consider others better than yourselves. Because the danger here is not not honoring people. The danger is this. If we live our lives only honoring ourselves and we become successful, we will fall into the trap that this is actually the way that we should live. If we fall into the trap that I'm most important, I need to survive, what's in it for me? How can this be best for me? If we fall into that trap, do you think we'll get power? Yes. Do you think we'll get prestige? Yes. Will we become successful at our jobs? Yes. But we will be deceived. That's the way that God wants us to live through prosperity. Honor is so important because it keeps our eyes clear of the blinders and the deception of selfishness. The greater fear is not living a self-centered life and failing. The greater fear is living a self-centered life and succeeding and thinking that's the way that we should live. I'll end with this. Sophocles, he was a great Greek uh, writer. He wrote a lot of plays, and um, they were tragic plays. And, you know, in Greek society, honor was so very important to them, just like it was the Roman society with Julius Caesar. And Sophocles, he put it simply like this, I would prefer to fail with honor than win by cheating. I would rather fail with honor than win by cheating. Honor is so important. And so here are two things that I want you to do to outdo one another in your culture and community in your church. Here's the first thing that you can do that will show honor to the people around you. Accept responsibility for my actions. It is not other people's fault for where I am in my life. It is not other people's fault for the choices that I make. One of the greatest things that you can do to be a person of honor is to have personal responsibility and to accept the responsibility for your own actions. Navy SEAL veteran Jocko uh, Jocko, he says this, you must own everything in your world. There is no one else to blame. Extreme ownership. I am responsible for me. It's not everyone else's fault for my success, or for my failure. See, we need to honor the people around us by taking ownership of who we are and where we're at in life. Husbands and wives, take responsibility for yourself. Parents and children, take responsibility for your actions. Business leaders, people at work, it may not be why you didn't get a raise because somebody outperformed you. It may be because you aren't performing yourself. Don't point the finger. Take responsibility, extreme ownership. Don't dishonor the people around you by pointing the finger. And here's the second thing that you can do. Give others credit where credit is due. Appreciate one another. Build one another up. Recognize one another. Don't make life all about you. Make life all about the people around you. You know, when David killed Goliath, he was recognized with the victory. He became the people's champion. It's okay for other people around you to succeed. It's okay for other people around you to have beautiful lives. Wonderful marriages, nice children, good jobs, health. Those things are okay. And it's okay to celebrate those things. Honor the people around you by taking responsibility for yourself and celebrate and cheer on the people around you. And you know what happened to Saul? Saul dishonored himself because he grew jealous of David. And he ended up up costing him his own life. Don't be like Saul. Saul. Don't be like the culture that honors things that are dishonorable. Be like Jesus, who honored the lowest of the low, who cheered people on, even to the point that it cost him his own life. Honor code. Honor others more than yourself. Let's stand and let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks.